Drew, you're gonna you're gonna learn something today. These people are gonna learn something. What are you know we what? learning? What are we we're gonna learn ten FPV trends that die. Die. And and two more that need to die. Hey guys, welcome to Rotorite. I'm Ladrib. And I am Joshua Bardwell. And, and as far as I know, I'm still a Rotorite cast member. Yeah. <laughs> It's getting harder and harder to uh, keep episodes with other people and them coming out. Whatever, we're getting creative. We'll find ways to uh, keep the content going. So we're talking about things that you guys may or may not even be aware that came and went in the FPV world. Things are always yeah. changing in FPV. As such, there are certain things that have come in real hot and eh, just kind of disappeared. Some of them were just a terrible idea to begin with. But others were the best possible solution. And then finally, something That's better true. came along. Well, you'll see. You'll see. Barton, well, what's our first FPV trend that died? The first FPV trend that died on this list is soft-mounted motors. And I think this is the best one we could start with because I'm not 100% sure that this trend wasn't a troll to begin with. <laughs> okay. Like, so the idea here is that your motors vibrate, your props vibrate, and those vibrations make it to your flight controller and your FPV drone isn't going to be able to fly as smoothly as possible. So there are still ways that we try to reduce those vibrations from making it to their gyro, both physical solutions like soft mounting your flight controller and software solutions like filters built into the flight control software. But along the way, one of the things that people were doing was soft mounting their, their motors themselves. So on January 13th, 2017, none other than Johnny FPV posted a video to YouTube called The Secret to a Perfect Flying Drone, Soft Mounting Motors. And you gotta listen to we... Johnny. If you guys aren't aware who Johnny is, you're under a rock because even people outside of the FPV world have heard of Johnny. You've seen his videos. They're some of the most spectacular, amazing visual masterpieces ever. That guy is a master of his craft. And at one point he said the secret to being as good as him is to soft, mount soft mounting motors. motors. Yeah. And he showed how you could take some strips of electrical tape, put them underneath your motors, and that provides enough soft mounting. And uh, there was a whole lot of debate. People were arguing whether one piece of electrical tape was good enough, whether it was two pieces, whether what kind of electrical tape. I even made a video where I tested a quad with and without soft mounting, and I showed that soft mounting does, in fact, reduce the amount of noise getting to the gyro. But you're not kidding. The amount of effort and time and, and agonizing that people were putting into this like no joke they were comparing different brands of electrical tape <laughs> now here's here's why this trend died soft mounting motors adds complexity if you screw the screws down too tight then the soft mounting isn't effective if you screw the screws down too loose then your motors fall off so this was a big deal yeah, we, we saw that happen to people and the other thing i saw is that flight controllers started coming with gummies like almost all flight controllers today come with gummies yes and they're and basically that, already soft mounted i believe is is really important i don't even consider flight controllers that don't have the soft mounting built in to me that's that's one of the greatest little tweaks that came about that made the the biggest difference that that i could tell so so here's the takeaway with filtering and soft mounting you want enough but more than enough is too much. You don't need it. And these days, especially with modern frames and modern flight control software, if you have gummies on your flight controller, you probably don't need to soft mount your motors. Soft mounting your motors can work, but it also adds a lot of problems and it is a trend that we're glad to see go. To this day, I'm not sure whether Johnny just said to Willie, I'll bet if I release a video saying this is the secret to a perfect flying <laughs> drone, the whole world, 126,000 views, Drew. I still think Johnny might have just been trolling us. The secret to making the greatest FPV films ever. That's the thing. Johnny, like, why does Johnny's drone fly so good? Because he's because Johnny. He's a freaking phenom. He's not, he's not like, you know what? My crunch flying like crap. Let me put some tape on the motors. Oh, my God. It's so good. <laughs> I think he was trolling. Okay. The next one is six bladed props. Believe it or not, this was actually a thing for a minute. People had props that had six blades to them. So... For a long while, two-bladed props were, like, the only thing. And then three-bladed props came out. And, it, oh, my God, it's so much better. The cornering, the grip, the acceleration. So if three is better than two, then four must be better than three. And some people do prefer four, and 
let's just keep going. And before long, we had six bladed props. I mean, here's the here's the premise is that as you add more blades, you, you basically get like better cornering. That's kind of what happens, all else being equal. A three-blade three, three blade prop will corner better, a four-blade prop will corner even better, but you get a little bit less top end because there's more drag. And you also, the props just become super fragile. The more blades you have, the easier it is to break a blade and have the prop be out of balance. So I feel like there just must have been a law of diminishing returns. So, like so six, but it did fly, right? Like, did yeah, you ever actually flew. see? I mostly saw pictures of them. I don't recall seeing videos of people actually flying. I just remember seeing tons of pictures of six bladed props. No, they props. flew, but but if fly. you think about it, like you got the hub, yeah. and then all the props are stuck into the hub, and the connection points are super thin. Right. And then the minute you crash, pff, the whole thing is just junk, and yeah. it's just like you don't. Nobody needs that much grip in the corners. It was it was overkill. The next FPV trend that died is super high rates. Now I'm not I, I'm not saying that. High rates are dead. There are still a ton of pilots out there that do really impressive tricks. But they could be better if they used lower rates. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. Is... <laughs> <laughs> super high rates. Why are? Why do you hate people who use super high rates? What's no, because because I'm not rates, talking Drew? about what we're seeing today, where there's still a good amount of snaps. What I'm talking about is there was a time when, I mean, people were setting their quads up with just. Ridiculous rates. It was actually a problem like you see on the forums of people asking, okay, I'm spinning so fast the gyro can't keep up. What do I have to do? And then, <laughs> do you remember that? And then they were actually yeah. talking about writing code in the beta flight where it would detect if you were spinning so fast that it would kind of like shut the gyro off for a second. And like it would go into just like kind of like a manual mode where like full yeah. stick was just like, whit, like full yeah, I, I remember that the, the original, there was a time, oh man, you're bringing back memories. Right. Because that it was like a problem they were trying to solve. When you went to full stick, it, the flight controller would basically shut down the PID loop. Uh -huh. And instead of trying to hit a target angular rate, it would just put the left motors to full and the right motors to zero and spin the quad as fast as it flipping could. Yeah. Now they don't do that anymore. No, well, because no one's trying to spin that fast anymore. And I mean, no one maybe needs to even, spin that fast. Yeah, no one needs to spin. It was like 2,000 degrees per second. I mean, it was yes. it was insane. And I remember one of the first times I, I flew with other people. It was the most terrifying sound. I pulled off my goggles because <laughs> he just went. It, it was like, <laughs> like it was doing just one of those deaths, death scream, yeah. death howl. And I guess there is almost something like mechanically impressive about it. When you see the quad just go like, <laughs> like there is something to it. But as far as actual FPV, I mean, you're it's so like, exceeding what you can visually see. It's like when a guitarist solos as fast as he possibly can. And instead of being something musical, it's just like a noise of notes battering you in the face. Yeah. When so you spin like, so fast, you can't you can't keep up. And that's, the, that's why I think this trend died. Because people think faster is more impressive, but eventually you get to a point where your fingers can't keep up. Mm -hmm. And you have no precision on the sticks. And I think people are just over trying to impress others by moving the stick all the way one way and the quad just going 3,000 degrees per second, just something crazy. Um, and they're actually doing tricks and flying with more purpose and not just showing like what the machine is capable of. It's more about what you're right. – because just spinning that fast, that shows off what the motors and the flight controller can do. But what you can actually do as a pilot – I think, you know, people are bringing it down. But so, like I said, there's still high rate pilots, but I think they're at a more reasonable place of like 1,200, maybe 1,300 degrees per second. That's still pretty high. That's, That's still, still pretty, pretty high, high, but it's not two or 3,000. I fly at, I'm at 900. Yeah. I'm at 900. I used I to see, be at 11. I came down to nine. I think overall people are lowering their Van rates. Vanover flies flying, at seven. All right, seven's a little slow. What do you fly at? Well, mine are super weird. Mine's at 850 <laughs> on roll six. 690 on pitch and like 400 what? on yaw. I know. Whoa. Yeah. That's super weird. And my yaw is okay. linear. It's a weird right, one. I want to I want to introduce the next one. This one is near and dear to my heart. Integrating your PDB or your OSD or your flight controller into the frame stack. Kids these days don't remember. Do you remember the ZMR250? Yeah, it which was, was like one of the, the first quad. cheap 5-inch frames. Yeah, and one of the and coolest then, things about it 
Yes. Was that it made the build so much easier. You could buy a version of it. One of the frame plates itself wasn't carbon fiber. It was a, a large PDB. It was a large circuit, was a circuit board. board. And you could solder your ESCs and your camera and your video transmitter and all this stuff to the like to the frame itself because the frame was made out of a circuit. It was super it, it seemed like such a good idea. And right? then it broke. Because it, you you you, you can't crash. flex. You can't flex circuit boards over and over again. <laughs> and they would and, just break constantly. And components popped off. And then and you'd it, have to and then you'd have to take your whole quadcopter apart because your bottom plate was your flight controller or your OSD. The, and you have to just tear the whole thing apart and replace it. And it was super expensive. It was but a bad idea. I think having surface mount components is where that really breaks down. Because one of the most popular frames that had some level of uh, you know, PDB integration is the alien. The inner plate of the alien is actually a yeah. PDB with press nuts integrated. Impulse kind of kept that alive in a sense for a long time. The difference was they didn't have any surface mount components. That PDB was purely just a power and ground. So there's really just two layers of copper and that flexing isn't going to crack any thin traces or you know, flex off any surface mounted components. So it worked really well on the alien, but ultimately you saw that impulse with the reverb and the PDBs they offered for that weren't structural anymore. It was a separate piece that taped onto the frame. That's the takeaway. Uh Electronic components should not be structural. Yes. And structural components should not have integrated electronics. Yeah. Not on a quadcopter that's going to crash. The next FPV trend that died, this one, we put it on the list almost as an homage Mm-hmm. to the sort of forefathers of FPV because this was before all of our time. It is making FPV goggles out of ski goggles. Yes. Long before we had super sleek fat sharks that, you know, looked like you were, you know, seeing into the future, people were piecing together FPV goggles out of, you know, what they what they could. And and one of the one of the ways to get good seal around the face where you wouldn't have light leakage between your eye and the screen was to retrofit uh, some some type of screen, whether it was a, a screen or, a, you know, an existing uh, display that's meant to be worn over your eye into ski goggles. So, so people were taking ski goggles, cutting the lens, blacking it out, fitting the, the display into the cut, sealing it with like silicone and whatnot, and that was at the time at the time i think that was one of the coolest options right the alternative was like having a, a literal box on your head but what were so they using they were, i mean the only one i remember were the the cinemizers the zeiss cinemizers the zeiss yes. cinemizers and i don't yeah. think everyone was doing that because they were really pricey i, I, do, I have to I believe i think i remember seeing a picture tim nilson of get FP, the get pv founder and he's got like ski goggle cinemizers Maybe we can find a picture that picture. But that was like one of handy. that was kind of this weird thing where they were taking this really expensive consumer product and then <laughs> hacking them into <laughs> ski goggles yeah. with hot glue and silicon. But that was yeah. I mean, that was you were the cool kid. You were flying FPV and that makes you super cool. And it was a trend because it was way better than, you know, using a monitor on a tripod or using some crazy box goggle. But then finally we started getting goggles like Fat Sharks. We finally got purpose made goggles that you know, met our needs. Another trend that died, that's another bit of a history lesson, is tricopters. Long before quadcopters became just the norm. I mean, quads are, that's what a drone is now. People were experimenting with different variations. One of the most popular ones back in the day was a tricopter. What made a tricopter so interesting, there weren't enough motors that you could just control the machine with thrust differentials. You actually had to put one of the motors on a tilting mechanism to get yaw out of it. Yeah, the big the big advantage of tricopters was that back before we had modern ESCs, motor braking was extremely weak. So you could push current through a motor and spin it up pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. But then when you wanted it to slow down, it couldn't slow down. It was just basically air drag slowed it down. And right. that meant that the yaw performance of a quadcopter was very, very poor because the motors could spin up only as fast as the motors spun down or the quad would get destabilized. And if you tried to make abrupt yaw moves, the quad would just kind of completely lose itself. But then tricopters were kind of the ultimate answer to that. You just tilt the motor and you get yaw. And there are still tricopter fans out there who love the kind of swooshy way I mean, that it's they cool. fly. No, they're cool. When I I yeah. love the sound of them. I love the look of them. I, 
I think they're awesome. They just fly like garbage <laughs> compared to modern. Compared to modern. Compared to modern drones. So you're absolutely yeah. right. You know what you're talking through is this history where tricopters actually were supreme for for a brief shining moment. Tricopters did outperform drones in the air because of that superior yaw performance. The disadvantage they always had was that mechanical complexity. In a crash, you had yeah. more moving parts that tended to break. And I mean, we That's can't true. talk about tricopters. Have we even said his name? Have we even said David, David Vindestall yet? David Vindestall. I mean, that was like the tricopter king. So all on the way, they were, gosh, that yaw performance was so good. But eventually, flight control software, ESC technology caught up. And now ESCs and flight controllers are capable of starting and stopping the motor so quickly that you can get really, really good yaw performance out of a quadcopter and people reach out to me sometimes and say hey i want to build a tricopter and i'm just like don't i mean like, it's an enthusiast <laughs> drone if you if you love tricopters and you want to build them like I mean, th there's classic car owners you know like that that want to drive the old carbureted engine and yeah it's a it's a pain in the butt and if it's if it's cold and you can't start and you got to tune it and all this stuff but but oh carburetor man carburetor if you're an enthusiast about carburetors maybe a tricopter's for you <laughs> if you want a good flying quad don't build a tricopter <laughs> the next fpv trend that died is glass nylon props kids kids do you like crashing and then taking off again without changing your props do you yeah, like it's the best. Coming back from a day of flying without having spent fifteen twenty dollars on new props, then you don't. You should you not like glass nylon props. You Wait. should be very thankful that glass nylon props thread. have finally been outmatched. <laughs> this was the plastic blend of props that was. It was the thing that the pros used because they did fly so much nicer than every other prop available. They had just this certain stiffness and lightness. Mm -hmm. The disadvantages, they were super fragile. Joshua is not exaggerating you, that every if crash. You touched a branch, they would yeah, explode. Just even a contact. There was no like power through the scraggle. Like, you know how you can fly on, on modern props and maybe you're getting some scraggle or some bushes and oh, oh, oh I'm still flying. That like are you, zero are you percent a chance. Back? Oh my god, bending. Oh, bend, you crashed bending into, like, a prop I'm gonna back. bend my prop back. Snap. It's not that that was the only thing available. There always were more durable prop options. And I actually never really got into the glass nylon thing. At the time when I was flying where my skill level was at and all that stuff, I never really so bought into the glass nylon. I was flying the durable props that were available. On the rare occasion that I did fly a glass nylon prop, the performance was just inarguably better. And it's easy to forget how spoiled we are today because freestyle pilots today assume that if you crash, you're going to be able to turtle mode. You're going to be able to limp home. Racers assume that if you hit a gate, you're probably going to be able to finish your laps. You know, maybe you'll get a little jiggle in the camera. None of that was possible. On no, glass no, we're props, so lucky that, they that were the finally king. they figured out some new plastic blends that yeah. allow props to be durable and high performance. So now we're flying props that I mean, they fly amazing. They're smooth, they're thrusty, they're lightweight, and they have that durability. Yeah, I remember I used to fly, uh, this was back when I flew 3S six inch oh yeah that's a trend <laughs> and uh and i was flying these six inch king kong props six inch king kong 60 40 by blades and they were okay and i switched to the hq 60 40 and they were oh my god so much better you go into a and proper glass nylon just it, it was it, it, was, it was incredible like a buck back 25 in the day. a yeah. buck 25 uh, a prop every time i crashed i was spending like three dollars yeah 25 times yeah that really two made 50. it you know every crash every time i crashed 250 250 i'd come back and i'd be like oh my god i just spent 25 dollars in props and uh that's a lot of money when you're not a professional uh doing this for a living the next fpv trend that died i don't think this was even ever a trend but i think what? it has to be on the list is 3d we're not it, what? no 3D we're died. not we're not dead. talking we're not talking about 3d flying oh no, zoe no, won't no. let that one die she will not let no. 3d flying die. 3D no we're flying. talking about stereoscopic 3d fpv i gotta tell you drew i'm not even sure this was a trend although i like i like having it in the video because uh -huh. like there were like two or three maybe cameras out there that supported 3d and 
like almost nobody ever bought them. A few people have reached out to me over the years and said, hey, ever tried 3D? It's kind of cool. And I've been like, no, not really. And then that's just it. I don't think this was ever really a trend. I, I feel like it's the exact definition of a trend where it, it came. I feel like there was an excitement around it. There was some following and then it just yeah. it never really grabbed on. So okay. So why? So the idea was people started thinking that it, it might be cool to fly with 3D video. It might help their proximity. They could actually see depth. think the idea is pretty sound. But to accomplish this, what you have to do is you have to provide each eye with a separate video coming from two cameras that are offset. That's what stereoscopic 3D video is. It's two cameras and each eye gets one image and then your brain puts yeah. together the two offset images and you see 3D. It's a trick that works very well. It's how 3D movies work actually. There are a couple problems with this. One of the problems is technical. You either need two cameras and two video transmitters and then you need a set of goggles with two receivers. Yes, you yeah. need each so eye. So Skyzone goggles actually that's how they do 3D. Skyzone does it that way. Right. Um, fat shark goggles only have one receiver, and the way they'll do it is they'll do every other scan line, or they'll split the screen down the middle vertically. It depends on the transmitter. Oh. And the problem with that is that you lose half your resolution. So your already crappy standard definition low resolution feed is now half resolution. Although some people have argued that like your brain puts it back together. But the real problem, I think, uh, and I've heard this from people who have actually flown this, is that the separation of the cameras to get close to human vision, you need so many inches of separation. And on a mini quad, you tend to get much, much less separation than that. And so you don't right. actually get a very strong stereoscopic effect. Did you ever fly 3D FPV? No. I did. I did actually. You because did? I, I no. did. I was kind of a late adopter to Fat Sharks. I started FPV on Sky Zones you did. and stuck That's with true. Sky Zones for a while. And Sky Zones, as you said, had a 3D function built in because the Sky Zone goggles had built in diversity. It is, it's a cool gimmick. The reality of it is you're not always that close to things. There's still multiple feet of distance between you and the object. And you really don't see that 3D effect until it's like right there anyway. I still don't know that it would be worth having to buy dedicated goggles for all that. All right. The next trend. Angled motor mounts. So pilots were angling their motors forward to get more forward what were they? Flight. Why were they doing it? So at the time, we didn't have so many dedicated FPV cameras available to, to buy. Pilots were using like board cameras. And the way oftentimes those board cameras were mounted to frames was like vertically on a piece oh. of vertical carbon. So, so you, cameras you were couldn't flat. just tilt your camera up. Camera tilt hadn't really come around yet. It wasn't really accept it wasn't really mainstream yet. Only only a few pilots were figuring out ways to actually tilt the camera. So what they started doing instead was, oh, let's tilt the motors forward. And that's how we'll be able yeah. to fly forward. I remember those early frames. They'd have a notch cut in the top plate, and you could do your board camera straight up and down. Right. Or you could tilt it like fifteen degrees. And that was just it. Oh, if that you was crazy. Something else. You could go five or 15 degrees, yeah. right? But that, that was pretty much your one so or two So if you options. wanted to go faster, you couldn't tilt the camera more. You couldn't pitch forward because then you couldn't see where you were going. So right. you were like, oh, let's tilt the motors. And it did work. But there were some problems. One of the problems is that when you take the motors off the plane of sort of rotation, you get coupling between the axes. Right. Um, and the flight controller gets a little bit confused. Well, what I what I did see people doing was they would actually then angle the flight controller too to compensate. So they angled the flight yep. controller so that the flight controller was on level with the motors. If you didn't, then the coupling you got would upset the flight controller. I guess another potential advantage of that approach is it lets you move faster with less up tilt so you get less drag, less wind oh, resistance. Oh, okay. There's something to that. There's I mean, that's that. that's legit, yeah. but nobody's nobody's doing this anymore. It died. So tilting things kind of leads into the next FPV trend, which is the camera couch. The camera couch. The faster you're going, the more angle that you have, the more that your recording camera ends up looking at the ground. So we started looking for ways, okay, how do you angle up your HD camera? So one of the first solutions that pilots came up with was a camera couch where they were putting their camera on some sort of wedge, usually like a piece of foam and then strapping it down. And that's how they were angling up their camera. You know, you say it was usually a piece of foam, um, but I'd like to show you a picture of my old camera couch. I'd like to remind everybody that this was before the days of 3D printing. 
you just went out to the barn and you worked with what you had. What? Oh, you used it. You used what? Oh my gosh, you used that wood. That is a piece of That's wood. Amazing. You're trying not to, you're trying, yes, yeah, so I heard what you did there. You changed the tone to be less, yeah. <laughs> Zip ties and wood, baby. Wood. And look at the wood bumper down on the. Uh, oh my gosh. Bumper. That's uh That's wood, baby. That's a there's, couch. There's some ingenuity there. And that camera's <laughs> a relic too. I mean, there's a trend, the Mobius, right? The Mobius I mean, camera. now we're all yeah. using, you know, GoPros or GoPro sessions. So we're either using cubes or kind of more of the vertical rectangle cameras, but the flat camera was a thing for a minute. I, I sometimes yeah. still think that there's some there's there's something to be said for that. But I mean, it uh, just takes up so much now. space on the top plate. But that was a more con- it's just it was a more common camera at the time to have this flat camera. Yep. So you really I mean, you had those long well, I mean, you couches. Couldn't have, if you couldn't afford a GoPro, that's just what you got was the Mobius. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I honestly I think the wood there's something to be said for your wood couch there because I I feel like the wood's going to be a lot less prone to camera ejections, and that's the biggest disadvantage was, of the yeah. camera couch. You're sticking your camera on a wedge piece of foam or wood and then just strapping it down one way or another but then when you crash you're just relying on a strap to keep your camera from going flying so now we have we have access to a plethora of 3d printed anything we could want for any camera we want and most people have gone 3d printed. the advent of durable 3d printed parts killed camera couches because no now, one uses camera couches anymore no, no there's the still some holdouts there's still some holdouts vanover yeah. was using a camera couch because he he had it in his this guy vanover is one of those guys that he just gets things in his head that he's convinced and one day he'll just say i, I think something about 3d printed mounts vibrations or something i'm going back to to go procession on a piece of foam with a camera strap and that's the butter and then what did we see that day we're looking for his camera in tall grass <laughs> with a freaking metal detector. And I don't know That's if a he big advantage. just losing the camera scarred him, but he went back to 3D printed mounts pretty quickly after that, I, I think. Yep. 3D printed mount, screw to the frame or strap to the frame. That's the way to do it. I, I, I got an extra piece I want to do for this video, which is I got a couple of trends in mind that need to die. They haven't died yet, but they need to die. Okay. And the first one is going to be, we've been seeing analog, a bunch of quads. Analog FPV. It needs to Go! It needs to go. Can we just get everyone on that digital hype already? Come on, baby. Are you done? I- <laughs> Rotoriot.com. DJI Digital FPV available now. So speaking of camera mounting, I've been seeing a ton of quads nowadays coming out with this GoPro, like a, just a GoPro screw mount. And I, I think what did that, two things did that. Number one, the Hero 8 came out. And it has built-in little clips for that mount. And uh-huh. Cinewhoops started using it. And Cinewhoops commonly need adjustable up tilt. So you wouldn't want to put a fixed up tilt 3D printed mount on your Cinewhoop. But Cinewhoops don't crash as much as freestyle quads. And I've seen some people start designing freestyle frames with that screw-in GoPro mount. Stop it. Do not do that. That is a terrible <laughs> idea. We have been down that road. We know what's down that road. Yeah, that's Neo. a trend that's come back because that, that was a thing. Like yeah. alongside with the camera couches, people were trying to use the stock GoPro mount. The the thing that comes with it, just a little stick on thing, sticking it to yeah. the top of the frame and literally it that sticking way. it on. They're pretty tough, but they're not durable by our yeah. standards. We're crashing into walls. So nowadays, at least you don't have to use the camera case anymore. You save a little bit of weight, but still, just stop it. Stop doing that. I mean, it, it sort Except of makes for sense Cinewhoop. for the okay. It sort of makes sense for the Cinewhoop yeah. because the high range of adjustability is more important than durability because you don't crash yeah. cinema whoops the same way that you crash five inch freestyle drones. The same could be said for even like a larger uh, <laughs> cinema base platform, like a seven inch, maybe a long range quad or something, something that's meant to do like filming where you're not going to be crashing, but on freestyle or race frames, yeah, doing, doing the, the, Go pro mount with this thumb screw thing. Not a good idea. So I agree that's, next, that's an FPV trend that needs to die. What's the next FPV trend that you think needs to die? There's one more. There's one uh-huh. more. We're going to keep this video positive. But there's one more trend that needs to go. And it's Analog so- FPV needs to die. Can we just stop already with it? Just listen. I, li- I'm not, I'll tell you what. I'm not, you saying, what? First- I'm not saying analog is dead. So I'm being very clear about that because... I get it. There's only one company right now that makes HD and you, you don't have the same sort of product selection. So I, I get why it's not dead yet, but I think ultimately 
I want to see more companies making HD FPV. I want to see <laughs> HD FPV get smaller. I just want wow. to see HD FPV keep getting better and better. And eventually, I want to see analog FPV die. Just can we all. You turned it around. Get- there we go. You turned it around. You know, when you first said it, I assumed you were about to shill for DJI. But no. you didn't. No. You just said analog needs to die. And I think that when you look at the technologies that are coming out, whether it's DJI or it's Fat Shark Bite Frost, I think it's clear that analog's days are numbered. And I think it's clear it, that digital is the die. way of the future. And analog I'm not saying needs, it needs to, I will get to behind die you on today. This. And I'm not saying it needs to die because people need to throw all their analog gear away and just buy DJI. I, I get it. If there's other <clears> gear that you want to use that's smaller, lighter, you want to support other, like that's fine. I'm not arguing against that. But I do look forward to more HD options coming out. And I think that that is what is going to happen. There is one trend <laughs> in FPV that is so pernicious. It is so overdone and usually done poorly. And it needs to die. Drift videos. People, you need to stop chasing drift cars with it's your quads. If you're going to chase a drift chase, car, if you're, I'm tired of it. If you're going to chase a drift car, I disagree. You better, you you better chase be drift Johnny cars all you want, baby. Chase them all you want. Just don't upload Just don't it to the internet. To I don't want to see it. <laughs> Just stop. Stop posting this to YouTube. That is probably the most, I don't want to say overdone, but the most done I'll FPV say it. thing. It's overdone. <laughs> You'll say it, it's overdone. The first time I saw drift drift FPV, I was like, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. And <laughs> then the 57th time I saw it, I was like, okay, uh, I think I've seen this before. And then I saw a few really good pilots do it. And I was like, oh, I see. There's levels here. And then I saw 57 more people do it badly. And I was just like, okay, just do something else. The dri- I don't know if it's going to go away, Bartolo. <laughs> I think the drift, drift FPV is... <laughs> It's so common; it's almost become its own genre. We got we got FPV racing, we got FPV freestyle, we got Cinewhoop, and we got drifting. It's just a thing now. You know, another trend that needs to die: flight videos with like twenty minutes of vlogging beforehand. Am I right? Whoa, whoa, <laughs> whoa, whoa! We're gonna need to wrap this one up before. Bardwell's on a mission now. We're going to need to wrap this one up, guys. So, Well, that is going to do it for this video. Those are 10 FPV trends that came and thank God went. A few we remember finally, some we're glad to see go, and some you never even knew existed. Let us know down in the comments, what do you think we should have put on this list? What did we overlook? If you say Rotor Riot died, I swear to God, I will ban you. That's, he's leave not the kidding. Comment. <laughs> Hit the like button. Subscribe to the freaking channel. Leave a comment, shop at store.rotoriot.com, and we will see you on the flip side. That's what people say, right? That's a trend that needs to go.